And if you have your Bible, open up with me to Psalm chapter 27. Psalm chapter 27, we are in a six-week series that we call Summer Psalms. Okay, we're going to read the whole chapter from verse 1 to verse 14. Okay, in count of three. One, two, three. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army came against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. For He will hide in His shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of His tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tents a sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. And I just pray, Lord, that you make this word come alive. So that this Christ from the heart of David will be the Christ of our heart as well, Lord. That what we want and what we desire about our fall is to see the beauty of the Lord. And I believe, Lord, that when we cry out that prayer together with David, you will answer us. Because it is your very desire for us to be captivated by your beauty more than we want and desire your beauty. So do that in the midst of us, Holy Spirit. Make these verses come alive and reveal to us the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. You guys may be seated. Today I titled my sermon, Prayer for the Anxious. How many of you ever felt anxious about life? Raise your hand, okay? If you do not raise your hand, you're anxious about what people think when you raise your hand. Now, I don't know if it's true or not, if you can develop sixth sense, but if anyone has sixth sense, let me tell you, it's my mom. Her sixth sense is a special sense to detect lies, okay? My mom is an expert at detecting my lies and everybody's lies. My dad can testify to that, okay? She can smell my lies from very far. And because of this unique gift of my mom, I was anxious every time I went out on a date in high school. Why? Because I knew I was not allowed to date at such a young age, okay? My parents had told me ever since I was like 14 or 15, they keep telling me this, okay? And I quote them, if you're not ready to get married, then don't date. And the emphasis on the later part, don't date. But today, it's the other way around. The emphasis not don't date, but when will you be ready to get married? So every time I went out on a date, secretly of course, I was anxious thinking, you know, what if my mom found out? So every time I, before I went out on a date, don't copy me guys, I would consider every possible scenario where my mom would find out that I went out on a date and I would make sure I cover my bases. And because of that, I became really good, really, really good at lying. Okay, I'm not proud of it, but I'm just telling you guys. Now, that means this, anxiety and worry, if we not handle it properly, it can be a doorway to many other sins. I mean, do you notice that the older you are, the more worrier you become? Have you ever realized that? I mean, when I was young, I pretty much did not worry about anything. But older people, they worry about everything, right? I mean, the older people, they worry about their husband, 
about their wife, about their children, retirement, bank account, dog, friends, neighbor, cousin, second cousin, cousin they never met, and ultimately they worry about themselves, about their health and everything. So they worry all the time. And I used to think when I was young, come on, older people, come on, chill, relax, okay? You, know, you need to start enjoying life. Stop worrying about all the time. You know, stop eating salad for once and start eating KFC for a change. I mean, that's, that'd be good, you know, right? That'd be cute cure to your anxiety. But what happened is this, even though I thought that way, what happened is this, I get older. And when I get older, I find myself becoming more and more anxious about life. Okay, why? Why do we become more anxious the more we grow old? Is that because the world is getting worse? I don't think so. Let me tell you why I think we are more anxious when we get older. Because when we are older, we are more in touch with the reality around us. Okay, we have more information. And more, the more information that we have, the more anxieties created inside of us. Isn't that true? Let me give you an example, okay? You just know that's gonna be in my sermon, wisdom teeth. Okay, now my, my dentist told, I just had my wisdom teeth taken a couple of days ago. My dentist told me uh, on my consultation last week, it will be fine. Okay, don't worry about it, it's just a mini surgery. It's gonna just take like five, 10 minutes, it'll be fine. You'll be okay, you don't have to worry, everything will be fine. So when my dentist say that, I'm like, all right, it's gonna be easy peasy. I plan my life as usual. So on the night of the surgery, I was supposed to meet someone for discipleship. And then the night after surgery, I was supposed to teach at Logos Discipleship. And then yesterday, I was supposed to meet with some older people to have food. And today, I was supposed to preach twice, today and right now and a couple of hours before. So I plan my life as usual, no problem. My doctors say, easy peasy, no problem. As they say, ignorance is bliss. But the night before the surgery, I chatted with Nate, okay, and I quote him. This is what he say. I had my wisdom teeth out, and I was out for a week. And just like that, I immediately become anxious. Uh-oh. Did I make the right choice? Okay, I have a lot of things to do, I need to do in the next couple of days. Then, and then I found out that Nate was right. My dentist lied to me. It was painful. I mean, I'm good with pain, but I cried during that surgery. I mean, and, and isn't that true? The more information that we have, the more anxious we become. Why? Because now we realize that people are actually not as nice as we thought they were right? We see people around us start dying. People get laid off from work, relational backstabbing, global pandemic, diseases, and many other. And, and then we realize sooner or later that the world that we live in is in a broken place. We live in a broken place filled with sinful people. And that is why bad things happen all the time, and there's no way to stop them from coming into our life. And that is why today many of us we live in fear and anxiety. So the question would be this, okay, but then how do we overcome fear and anxiety then? Okay, how do we overcome that? Now, if you go to a bookstore, you will see a lot of books written on dealing with fear and anxiety. Okay, because why? This, this issue is very popular. People want to know how to get rid of my fear and anxiety. So people will go to bookstore and they'll find books pretty much say the same thing. This is their uh, remedy to cure anxiety. This is the world answer. This is this. All you have to do is to think positive. Do not waste your time and energy thinking about the what if scenario. Because they said nine out of the 10 things that you think might happen actually do not happen. So what you need to do is stop thinking and visualizing the bad and start focusing on the positive, okay? So that's what you do. Visualize the positive, remove the negative. Anyone, anyone hear that before? Does that sound familiar to you? Because that's the word answers to uh, fear and anxiety. But let me tell you, it does not work. Do you know why? Because there's still one out of 10 chance <laughs> what we fear might happen will happen. Are you with me on that? So if that's the case, what if that thing happened and I'm not ready for it? So you become more anxious about it. So the world system to think positive does not work. But let me tell you another way, the Bible's way. And the Bible way is very, very different from the world. And it's very realistic. Okay, this is what the Bible says. The Bible says that we can assume the worst may happen and yet not overcome by fear and anxiety. It is very possible to experience the worst in life and yet 
have confidence. It is possible to have unshakable confidence even when our world turns upside down. So the, the Bible's way is not to assume the worst will never happen. But the Bible way is there's a way that even when the worst happens, you can still be confident. How many of you want that? Okay. Psalm 27 is the answer to that. Now let me give you the context of the psalm first. Well, the psalm itself is known as the psalm of confidence. It is written by King David. It is probably the number one psalm known as the most comforting psalm. And we do not know what exactly happened when David wrote this psalm, but we know that David was in some kind of trouble. And he asked the Lord. In the midst of the trouble, he cries out to the Lord. So he wants the Lord to protect him. He wants the Lord to guide him. Yet throughout the search for protection and guidance, David remain confident. And Psalm 27 encourages us that to trust the Lord in the day of trouble. It tells us this, that the answer to the problem of fear and anxiety is to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. Okay, what does it mean? Okay, I have 40 minutes to explain that to you. I separate this Psalm into four sections. David's source, David's plea, David's despair, and David's confidence. Let's look at the first one. David's source. First one to three. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foe, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamps against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war arise against me, yet I will be confident. So in this passage, David tells us what is his source of confidence. And it's very clear. David's source of confidence is not in his own ability or strength, but in the Lord. The Lord is David's source of confidence. Now, pay attention to the images that he used. He used three images. Light, salvation, and stronghold. What does it mean for God to be light? For the Lord to be light, it means this. The light in the Bible symbolizes everything that is positive. But the main function of light, what is it? To illuminate darkness. You with me on that? That's the main purpose of light. But then, not only that the Lord is David's light, but the second is the Lord is David's salvation. Why? Because when light illuminates darkness, what happens is this. It saves you from the potential harm that might hit you in the darkness. Let me give you an example. How many of you, when you were young at least, used to be afraid of darkness? Can I see your hand? I raised my hand. I used to be afraid of darkness. Why? Why were we afraid of darkness? Let me tell you why. We were afraid of darkness because we believed there's this potential harm that might happen to us in the darkness. You with me on that? See, the reason that I was afraid of darkness when I was young is because I was afraid of ghosts. How many of you are like me? Okay, I, I, I believe, I'm, I'm really convinced that if I turn off my light when I go to bed, then the ghosts, all the ghosts will start to invade my room and play in my, in my room. But when the light is on, I'm safe. I feel confident because I can see everything around me. And this is what David says, so the Lord is light and salvation, the Lord protect the, from the potential harm. But not only that, but the Lord is also stronghold. What is stronghold? Stronghold is a place of refuge where you find protection from enemy. So let's put this picture together, light, salvation, and stronghold. So the Lord not only illuminates darkness and save David from potential harm, but he's also a place of refuge where David finds protection from enemy. And notice what David say. David does not say the Lord give light, salvation, and stronghold, but what does David say? The Lord is light, salvation, and stronghold. With another word, what David says is, the Lord himself is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold. And if the Lord is my light, my salvation, and my stronghold, the question is, whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? The answer is, nada. It does not mean that David has no enemy. Because then you read in verse 2 and verse 3, then David will imagine the worst case scenario where he's surrounded by people who want to eat up his flesh. Okay, this is not zombie, by the way. Zombie is not real. This is a metaphor of people who want to kill David. Now, think about it. So David say, even when people want to kill me, even when I'm surrounded by army trying to kill me, I shall not fear. This is something very, very unique. 
I think it's safe to say, I think all of us in life, we have people who do not like us. Agree? Agree on that? If you're liked by everyone, you must be God. I'm pretty sure all of us have people who do not like us. I'm pretty sure maybe, in, in fact, in this place, there will be some of you who might be happy when I've inflicted pain by my deadness. Okay, When I took my wisdom teeth, I, I was in pain. You might be happy because of that. That's fine. But I am sure, at least, none of you desire to kill me. Right, guys? I hope so. At least that I know of, no one wants to kill me as of today. But David says, even when he's surrounded by a group of people who want to take his life. So David's imagined the worst scenario that might happen to him. And he says this, even though, even so, I shall not fear. So what, with another, what, they, what David says is, because David's confidence is in the Lord, because the Lord is my light to guide me, because the Lord is my salvation to deliver me, because the Lord is my stronghold to protect me, and if the Lord is for me, what can my enemy do to me? You with me on that so far? So that, that's David's logic. David said, well, if the Lord is for us, then who can be against us? So the question is this. The question for us is this, my friend. It's not whether the Lord is for us or not. The question for us to you and me is this. Who or what is our light, salvation, and stronghold? Who or what do we go to when life seems too much to handle? Is it our spouse, children, work, Netflix, ESPN, game, porn, hobby? The bad news is whatever we place our confidence in beside the Lord will fail us. The good news is if we put our confidence in the Lord, He will not fail us. That's the first one. So that's David's source of confidence. That's the reason why he can be confident no matter what happens. But then look at David's plea. This is very interesting. Second one, David's plea, verse 4 to 6. One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me higher upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his ten sacrifices with shout of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Now, this is beautiful. In English, you can't really see it because in English, it's only say one thing. But in Hebrew, in the original language, the language is so much stronger than one thing. So what David basically says is this in English, if, if I can translate it literally, he says this. What David is communicating to you and me is he's saying this. I don't care what it costs. I don't care how long it takes. There's one thing that I want more than anything in life. There's one thing that I will continue to seek after. And if, this, if I just have this one thing, then everything will be okay. But if I do not have this one thing, I can have everything else, and it is meaningless. That's the idea that Hebrew communicate. Okay, let me put it this way. Imagine if one day uh, you meet Jeff Bezos, and he asks you, what do you want? Ask me for one thing, whatever it is, I will give it to you. What's your answer? I mean, Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world. According to a very trustworthy source called Wikipedia, his total net worth value is eight trillion US dollar. That's trillion with 12 zero, by the way. So most of us only have four to six digit number on our bank account. Three if you're college students. So think about it. And now Jeff Bezos come to you and said, ask me, whatever it is that you want, I will give it to you. What is your answer? But let me increase the stake. Not Jeff Bezos, but the Lord of the universe himself come to you and say, ask me one thing that you want. Whatever it is, the Lord will give it to you. What will you ask? Would you ask for a fat bank account? Would you ask for you to be able to marry a certain person? Happy family? Successful career? Worldwide recognition? Healing? Or maybe some of you are spiritual like Solomon? wisdom. What will you ask from the Lord? Because he will give it. Just one thing that you will ask from the Lord, he said, I will give it. You know what David say? One thing that I ask from you, Lord, is your presence. 
That's what David said. I mean, out of all the things that David can ask from the Lord of the universe, he asked what? One thing, God, that I want more than desire. I want to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. It does not mean he wants to stop being a king and start being a priest. No. What he's trying to communicate is he wants to feel, experience the constant presence of God. That's what he desired the most. Why? Because David understands one thing. If the Lord is his source of confidence, then what David needs above all is the presence of the Lord himself. See, the cure to fear and anxiety is not to have more things, but to have the presence of the Lord. However, David does not stop there. He says that he wants to dwell in the house of the Lord. Why, David? David will give us the answer. Why? Because, Lord, I want to gaze at your beauty. I want to gaze at the beauty of the Lord. Now, the word gaze means this. Okay, this is what the word gaze means. Do you realize what I'm doing? Maybe not, because my eyes are small. The word gaze means to stare intently, to look at something very, very intently. That's what the meaning of the word gaze. So now what David says, Lord, I just want to stare intently at your beauty. That's what I need. With another word, that means this. When David think about the Lord, he does not only think of the Lord as someone useful, but he think of the Lord as someone beautiful. Because guys, you know this, okay? Especially guys, because guys like to stare. Guys, you know this. We do not stare at someone who is useful to us. The waitress might be useful and kind to us, but we do not stare at her unless she is beautiful. Guys, come on, admit it. Come on. Am I the only one? We don't stare at someone who is useful. We stare at someone who is beautiful. And that's what David said. I want to stare at you because you're beautiful to me. Oh yes, the Lord is useful for David. The Lord hides David in his shelter on the day of trouble. The Lord exalts David high upon a rock in the presence of his enemy. But here's what happened. What the, all the goodness of the Lord for David only make the Lord even more beautiful than before. So he's captivated at the Lord's beauty. For David, nothing is better, nothing is better, greater, grander, more satisfying, more enjoyable, more dependable, more lasting, more rewarding than the Lord himself. What David seeks after is not what the Lord can do for David, but the Lord himself. Here's what he say. My greatest need is the Lord. My greatest joy is the Lord. And if I have the Lord, if I have what I want the most in life, in the Lord, then I'm safe. I am fearless. I will not be anxious. I have no reason to. Now, this is very deep. Let me tell, explain to you why this is very deep, okay? What David just said is very, very deep. St. Augustine has a very interesting insight into anxiety. Think about it. Why are we anxious? By the way, little anxiety is good. If you do not feel anxious about anything in life, it means you're a zombie. You have no emotion. You do not care about anything. So little anxiety is actually a good thing. So I'm not talking about that. But what I'm, my question is, is, why are we overly anxious? Do you know what I mean by overly anxious? Why are you sleepless at night? Why you can't get rid of that fear in your mind and your heart? Why are you staying up at night thinking about that very thing? Here's why. You might not like my answer, okay? But blame St. Augustine. This is his answer. St. Augustine says this. This is the reason why we are overly anxious. The reason we are overly anxious is because this. Every one of us, we love and desire many good things. And they're not wrong. Career is a good thing. Parents and children is a good thing. Sex is a good thing. Money is a good thing. So all of us, we desire a lot of good things in our life. But when the good thing becomes the one thing that we need in order for us to be happy, at that moment, anxiety hit. When the good thing in life becomes the one thing in life that we gotta have, that unless we have that thing, we are not happy, anxiety hits. So that means this, St. Augustine brilliantly says this, that means this, when you realize that you're anxious about something, that's a good thing. Why? Because when you trace the root of the anxiety, so anxiety is like smoke. When you trace that smoke, you will find fire. And in that fire, you will find what is actually your true source of confidence. What is that you're holding in your life right now? 
at the root of our anxiety, we will find a counterfeit God that has become our source of confidence. When the good thing becomes the one thing, we will be very anxious. You with me so far? David gives us wonderful illustration in verse 10. He says this, For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Here's a question. Is there anything wrong between, about the love of parents and children? No, that's a good thing. So the love between parents and children is something that God intended for us to have. So it is only normal for parents to love their children, and it's only normal for children to be warned to be loved by their parents. It's only normal. But here's the question. What happens if our parents do not love us? I think I watch Korean drama enough to know the answer. In a lot of Korean drama, you will see that every time there was an orphan, they will grow up thinking, what did I do wrong? Why? Why did my parents do not love me? Why did my parents leave me? Why did my parents forsake me? You see that pattern in Korean drama? And not only in Korean drama, but you see that pattern around us every time. Every time someone is forsaken by their parents, the thing that they're going to say is this, you know what? I will not forgive my parents. I will not let them, you know, off the hook because of what they did to me. They forsook me. I will never be okay. I will be, always be angry and unhappy because of what they did to me. Why? Let me tell you why. Because the good thing, parental love, have become the one thing. You with me on that? The good thing have become the one thing, and that created anxiety. As a result, they become very anxious. So now, because they cannot feel that satisfaction, they begin to look to other things to feel like they're somebody. And that is what St. Augustine is telling me. Our anxiety will reveal to us what is actually our source of confidence in life. So if you pay attention to your anxiety, it will reveal to you, it might reveal to you, a counterfeit God's. But listen to what David say. For my father and my father, my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. With another word, what David says is this, the Lord is my one thing. And if I have my one thing, even if I might not have my parents' love, I'll be okay. Because I have the most important thing in life. My parents might forsake me. My career might forsake me. My lover might forsake me. My health might forsake me. But the Lord will not forsake me. The Lord will take me in. And friends, if the Lord is our one thing, you and I will not be overly anxious about anything. That's David's plea. That's why David says, there's only one thing that I want. I want you, Lord. But look at the third one, despair. David's despair in verse 7 to verse 12. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. You have said, seek my face, and my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger, or you who have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemy. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for four witnesses have risen against me, and their bread out Friends. If the Lord is David's one thing, do you know what is this despair? To not have the Lord. And that is what happened. So there's a sudden change of mood in these verses. So in verses 1 to 6, David described his confidence in the Lord. But verse 7 to 12 describe David's desperation for the Lord. And this is something that we must understand. Just because you have confidence in the Lord, it does not mean you're not struggling. So David here in the same psalm, in the same breath, he has total confidence in God, yet at the same time, he's desperate for the Lord. Why? Because he's in a situation, we don't know exactly what happened, but verse 12 seems to suggest that there's many false accusations against David. And because of that, David feels like the Lord is absent from his life. I mean, have you ever felt that way? I mean, you know the Lord is for you. You know the Lord loves you, but you feel like He's absent from your life. You feel like He's not there. And if you feel that way, you're not alone because David knows exactly 
how you feel. But pay attention to what he does. When David feels like the Lord is absent, you know what he does? He does not walk away from the Lord. He does not say, you know what, Lord? Mind your own business. I'm going to mind it on my own business. No, no. When David feels like the Lord is absent, what he does is he presses in even more. David seeks the Lord all the more. In verse 7, he asks, Lord, hear me. In verse 8 and 9, he said, Lord, do not forsake me. In verse 11, he said, Lord, guide me. And in verse 12, he said, Lord, protect me. So even though he does not feel the presence of the Lord, he said, but I want that. So that's why I'm going to pursue you even more. I'm going to run in into, into you even more. Because David has this confidence that even when your parents forsake you, the Lord will never forsake you. He has that ultimate confidence. That means this, my friend. David not only see the Lord as useful, but beautiful. And that is why even in his despair, he seek the Lord. When we see the Lord as beautiful, we not only seek him for what he can do, but we seek him for him. Now let me give you an example. Last month, I just celebrated my 18th birthday. And I received many gifts from you guys, okay? And interestingly, I received seven diff different gift cards and all goes to the same store, seven. Any guess what story it is? Kurong, okay? One person told me that when he thought of a gift from me, he immediately thought of Kurong. Okay, I'm like Kurong brand ambassador. Here's what I'm gonna say to it. When Jesus was tempted in wilderness, he said that man shall not live by bread alone. If I can rewrite that first, it's gonna say this, Yossi does not live by Kurong gift card alone. <laughs> but why? Why does a lot of you give me good Quran gift card? Let me tell you why. Because you know your pastor. You know that I love reading, especially theological books. That's why I have so many give Quran gift card. But what you might not of this, and I'm not proud of this, is this. There used to be a time that I hated reading. I graduated from my first Bible college, three years in America, without finishing a single book. Okay, and I'm in, trained to be a pastor, and I did not finish a single book that they told me to read. But what I did is I skimmed through them. I skimmed through them enough in order for me to pass the exam. Okay? So I read so that I can finish the exam. I need, to, I need to pass the exam so that I can graduate. I need to graduate so that I can have a degree. I need a degree so that I can have a career. I need a career so that I can make money. So in the past, reading was useful to me. When I read, I make money. But today is very different. Today you know that I spend most of my money buying books. So today what happens is, if before in the past reading was useful to me, today reading is beautiful to me. Reading is an enjoyment in itself. It is, it is pleasurable to me. And this is my friend, it's the biggest different between religious people and gospel people. Religious people seek the Lord to get things. But gospel people, they want the Lord for the Lord. And religious people serve the Lord so that the Lord might give them many things that they want. But gospel people serve the Lord because they want the Lord. Gospel people just want to be near the presence of the Lord. The Lord is the ultimate beauty. The Lord is the one thing. The Lord is the ultimate good. And this is the reason why David continued to seek pressing to the Lord even in despair. Why? He's not angry. He's not bitter because he understands even though he might not feel the presence of the Lord, what he needs is the Lord himself. That's what it means to see the Lord as beautiful. Because the Lord is beautiful, David persevered. Which leads me to my last point, David's confidence. Verse 13 and verse 14. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I mean, the dude is extremely confident. Even though he has yet to experience his breakthrough, he never loses hope. He's confident that he will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. With another, he's confident that the Lord will come through. 
He's confident that the Lord has not abandoned him. And then he tells himself and everyone around him, church, wait for the Lord. Take courage, wait for the Lord. Let me, some, let me tell you something about waiting. I hate waiting. Anyone know what I'm talking about? I'm a patient person, I think. But if there's one thing that makes me impatient, it's waiting. I hate waiting. I like yes and no. Whether you tell me you can come or you cannot come, but don't make me wait. I mean, I would rather take things into my own hand rather than wait. <laughs> but here's the thing that we know about the Lord. He loves to make us wait. He just does. And why? I think, I think if we understand why, I think, I think this is my answer. You might disagree with me, but I think the Lord loves to make us wait. It is because in the season of waiting that we actually find a true source of confidence. It is in the season of waiting that we find out whether we have genuine faith or counterfeit. It is in the season of waiting that we find out whether the Lord is only useful or He's beautiful. And when the Lord is our source of confidence, we will wait for the Lord in the days of trouble because we know that the Lord will not forsake His people. And let me sum it up now, okay? I have 10 minutes to sum this up. So the question will be for us will be this. How? Well, yes, okay, amazing. I mean, David is great. He's amazing. He's a man after God's own. I, I get it. I get that he can have the confidence, but how? How can he have that confidence that the Lord will never ever abandon him no matter what? How can, can he have the guts to say that even when his father and mother forsake him, the Lord will not forsake him? And he gave us the answer. And I think his answer will give us the answer how we can have the same confidence. In verse 4, One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Here's what David say. David say, God, what I want to do, what I long to do is I want to gaze at your beauty, but not anywhere else. I want to gaze at your beauty and I want to inquire about you where? In your temple. So that means that there's something about the temple of God that captures David's attention. There's something about the temple of God that captures David's imagination. I mean, David know that the Lord's presence is everywhere. He's the man who writes Psalm 139. Where can I go from your presence? If I go to Himalaya, you're there. If I go to Sydney, you're there. If I go to Papua, you're there. If I go to the depth of the sea, you're there. So David know that the presence of the Lord is everywhere. But yet at the same time, David also said there's something about the temple of God that reveal His beauty. What is it, David? What do you see in the temple of the Lord? Two things. First thing that David sees is, David sees the holiness of the Lord. Because more than anywhere else in Scripture, more than any other places, the, Lord, the temple reveal the holiness of God. Because the temple will tell you and me, you cannot approach the Lord just because you feel like it. Because the God is absolutely holy, He cannot even tolerate the smell of sin. And that is why when you come to the temple, if you want to get in into the side of the temple, you've got to wash yourself and you've got to offer many sacrifices of sin. It tells us one thing that God cannot stand sin. He hates it. He's holy. And therefore, in order for us to have relationship with the Lord, they require many sacrifices. And if you try to approach the Lord without doing the right ritual and offering the right sacrifice, do you know what happened? The Lord will kill you on the spot. Bam. You die just right there. So when David looked at the temple of God, he says, oh, my God, he's holy. But that is not the only thing that he see. The second thing that he see, David see the mercy of the Lord. Because although the Lord is holy, he makes provision so that he can be with his people. He makes a way that, so that sinful people like you and me, we can draw near to his holy presence. So now in the temple of God, yes, David see God is holy, but yet at the same time, David see that God is so loving that he wants to be near us. So he makes a way. Okay? And that's why David said, I just want to gaze at the beauty of God and inquire of his temple. There's something about the temple of God that reveals the beauty of God. 
So how does that apply to us? Should we go to Jerusalem and stare at the temple of Jerusalem? No. Because Jesus himself said, I am the temple of the Lord. See, now today we don't have to stare at the temple in order to know the beauty of God because Jesus himself is the beauty of God. Jesus himself is the beauty and the temple of God. So the way that us, for us to have that confidence in terms of fear, anxiety is this. We have to gaze on Jesus. And you know what you see when you gaze on Jesus? I love it. Isaiah put it this way. Isaiah 53, verse 2 to 6. For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrow and acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteem him not. Surely he has borne our grief and carried our sorrow. Yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wound we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Here's what you see when you see Jesus. First of all, when you look at Jesus, you see the holiness of the Lord. You see what it cost the Lord to forgive us. The Lord cannot tolerate sin. And the Lord requires payment for sin. And when you look at Jesus, do you know what you see? You see the glorious God, the most beautiful one, became ugly. Isaiah said that we do not even want to look at Jesus. His face is so ugly, was so ugly to the point that we do not want to stare at him. The most beautiful one became unbeautiful. Why? Because Isaiah tells you and me at the cross, Jesus took what you and I deserve. Jesus took the curse, the punishment of our sin, and that is why at the cross he became ugly. He became unlookable. So why? So that when you and I put your faith in him, what happens is this, what Jesus deserved become what we have. So when Jesus became ugly at the cross, when we put our faith in him, we become beautiful in the sight of God because we receive what Jesus deserves. We receive the righteousness of Christ. And my friend, and that is the reason, the second thing that you see when you look at Jesus, not only the holiness of God, but you see the mercy of the Lord. You see how God cannot tolerate sin and yet God himself paid the price of his sin. He sent his one only son to die, to took the punishment of sin. He became ugly for you and me so that you and I might become beautiful. So how? So then how can we have confidence when we face fear and anxiety? How can we have confidence even when the worst thing happened in our life? How can we overcome fear and anxiety? The answer is simple. The cross of Jesus Christ. Because at the cross of Jesus Christ, you see the holiness of the Lord and the mercy of the Lord kiss each other. And it is stunningly beautiful. When we see Jesus lost his beauty so that we might have beauty, that is the beauty that will cure our anxious heart. What you need in order to overcome that fear anxiety is to make the Lord your one thing. And the only way you can make the Lord your one thing is to see the beauty of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let me sum it up. I wish I can tell you, guys, here's the one thing that you need to do tonight. And if you do it, you will never, ever, ever struggle with fear and anxiety. I wish I can tell you that. But I'm sorry, I cannot. There's no quick fix. Why? Because you and I, every day we are tempted to make good things become the one thing in our life. And that is why in our Christian life, there's nothing more practical than to constantly immerse ourselves in the gospel. Nothing brings greater peace to our troubled soul than to constantly meditate on what Christ has done. Nothing put life in the right perspective than seeing the surpassing greatness of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
nothing empower us to make the hard choices, to say no to the pleasure of sin, than savoring the glory of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. It is only when we make Jesus Christ our one thing that we become less anxious about many other good things. Or as one hymn said, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. How do we over- overcome fear and anxiety? It's only one. Gaze at the beauty of the gospel. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you show us that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be anxious about life. And you send your Son, Jesus Christ, to prove that to us. And we look, when we look at the cross, we see the beauty of God manifested. We see the holiness and the mercy of God kiss. And it's beautiful. We see our sin, the price of our sin was paid in full. And because of that, you won our heart. So God, I pray that you continue to help us to look to you. Continue to captive, captivate our heart with your beauty. And every time, every day, we wonder, remind us to turn our eyes on you, to gaze on the beauty of the gospel, so that we grow more and more in love with you, so that the good things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of your glory and grace. And we ask this in the name of beloved Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's turn to our faith as we